Hello Lost Souls. Welcome to the channel for another midnight video. I have some amazing tales for you tonight, and the best way for you to support me in creating more content is to share this video and give it a like. And now, let's dive into those midnight stories. It's Friday night, and I'm finally home alone, a rare luxury that I cherish. The week has been long and exhausting, and I look forward to unwinding in the comfort of my own space. I kick off my shoes, feeling the cool hardwood floor beneath my feet, and head to the kitchen to make a cup of tea. The house is unusually silent, and I revel in the tranquility. There's no one to bother me, no demands on my time, just an evening of relaxation ahead. I settle into the couch with my tea and a good book, the soft glow of the lamp casting a warm light around the room. Outside, the wind whispers through the trees, creating a soothing background noise. It's peaceful, almost too peaceful, but I push the thought away, reminding myself to enjoy this rare solitude. As I read, the shadows in the room seem to deepen, taking on strange shapes that flicker at the edge of my vision. I tell myself it's just my imagination, but the sense of being watched begins to gnaw at me. I turn up the lamp, hoping the brighter light will dispel the creeping unease. The wind picks up, howling through the trees and rattling the windows. A branch scrapes against the glass, sounding eerily like fingernails. I shiver and pull a blanket around me, trying to focus on my book. But the words blur together, my mind distracted by the growing sense of dread. I try to brush it off, thinking that maybe I'm just tired from the long week. I take a sip of my tea, now lukewarm, and glance around the room. Everything is in its place, but the atmosphere feels heavy, almost oppressive. I shake my head, forcing myself to relax. Deciding to change the ambiance, I light a few candles, hoping their warm glow will create a more comforting environment. The flickering flames cast dancing shadows on the walls, but instead of soothing me, they seem to twist into sinister shapes. I take a deep breath, trying to calm my nerves. I put my book down and decide to watch a movie instead thinking the noise and visuals might help distract me. I choose a lighthearted comedy, something that will lift my spirits. As the movie plays, I find myself constantly glancing at the windows and doors, half expecting to see something or someone outside. Just as I'm starting to relax, a loud thud echoes from the basement. My heart skips a beat. It's probably just the old house settling, I tell myself. Still, I can't shake the feeling that something is off. I decide to investigate, hoping to dispel my growing unease. I cautiously approach the basement door, the silence of the house amplifying each of my footsteps. My hand trembles as I turn the knob, and I hesitate for a moment before pushing the door open. The air that rushes out is colder, carrying a faint, musty odor. I fumble for the light switch and descend the stairs, the steps creaking under my weight. The dim light from the single bulb flickers slightly, casting eerie shadows across the room. I scan the basement, looking for anything out of place. Boxes and old furniture are stacked haphazardly, covered in a fine layer of dust. I start to turn back, but then I notice a small, unfamiliar object on the floor. It's a toy car, one I don't recognize. My heart skips a beat. I don't have any kids, and I don't remember seeing this before. Unease prickles at the back of my neck, but I brush it off assuming it must have been left by a friend's child during a visit. As I bend down to pick up the toy car, I hear a faint whisper. It's so quiet that I can't make out the words, but the tone is unmistakably sinister. I whip around, shining my phone's flashlight into the corners of the basement. The light reveals nothing but shadows and dust, yet the feeling of being watched intensifies. I quickly retreat up the stairs, locking the basement door behind me. Back in the living room, I try to shake off the unsettling feeling. I lock the basement door behind me, more for peace of mind than anything else. Back in the living room, I resume reading, but my concentration is broken. The wind outside has picked up, howling through the trees and rattling the windows. I glance toward the large bay window and freeze. For a split second, I think I see a shadow move across the yard. I tell myself it's just my imagination playing tricks on me but the sense of being watched lingers. I draw the curtains, trying to shut out the darkness and whatever might be lurking in it. My heartbeat is louder now, thudding in my ears, 
I turn on some music, hoping the familiar tunes will calm my nerves. The music helps for a while, and I start to relax again. But every now and then, I catch a glimpse of movement from the corner of my eye. Each time I tell myself it's nothing, just the shadows playing tricks. But the unease is persistent, gnawing at me like a dark presence just out of sight. I check the locks on the doors and windows again, feeling a strange compulsion to ensure everything is secure. Each click of a lock brings a momentary sense of relief, but the feeling of being watched remains. I return to the couch trying to lose myself in the movie, but the tension is palpable. Suddenly the power flickers, causing the lights to dim momentarily. My heart leaps into my throat as the room is plunged into semi-darkness. The flicker lasts only a second, but it's enough to unsettle me further. I clutch the blanket tighter around me, feeling like a child again, afraid of the dark. The wind outside howls louder, making the house creak and groan as if it's alive. I glance nervously at the drawn curtains, half expecting to see a face pressed against the glass. Just as I'm starting to calm down again, the phone rings. The sudden noise startles me and I nearly drop my cup of tea. I glance at the caller ID, but the number is unrecognized. Hesitantly, I answer. Hello? I say, my voice trembling slightly. There's a pause, and then a raspy voice speaks. Is someone there with you? My blood runs cold. Who is this? I demand, trying to sound braver than I feel. The line goes dead. I hang up, my hands shaking. It's probably just a prank, I tell myself, but deep down, I know something isn't right. I check all the doors and windows again, making sure they're locked. The feeling of being watched is stronger now, a prickling sensation at the back of my neck. As I double check the locks, I hear a soft tapping on the window. I freeze, my breath catching in my throat. Slowly, I turn to face the sound. For a moment, I see nothing but darkness outside. Then, a flash of lightning illuminates the yard and I see it. A figure standing just beyond the window, staring in at me. The figure is tall and shadowy, features obscured by the darkness. My heart pounds in my chest as I back away from the window, bumping into a table and nearly knocking over a lamp. I grab my phone, my fingers fumbling as I dial 911. The operator's voice is calm and reassuring, but I can barely focus on her words. There's someone outside my house, I whisper, my voice shaking. Please, send someone quickly. As I wait for the police, the figure outside remains motionless, watching. I keep my eyes fixed on the window, afraid to look away. Minutes feel like hours as the wind howls and the shadows dance around the room. Finally, I see the flash of red and blue lights approaching, and I breathe a sigh of relief. The police search the yard but find no sign of the intruder. They assure me that everything is fine, that it was probably just a trick of the light. But as they leave, I can't shake the feeling that someone, or something, is still out there, watching me. I close all the curtains tightly, shutting out the night. But the sense of unease remains, a dark cloud hanging over me. I try to distract myself with the movie, but every noise, every flicker of shadow makes me jump. The night stretches on, each minute feeling longer than the last. Just as I'm starting to relax again, the phone rings. The sudden noise startles me, and I nearly drop my cup of tea. I glance at the caller ID, but the number is unrecognized. Hesitantly, I answer. Hello? I say, my voice trembling slightly. There's a pause, and then a raspy voice speaks. Is someone there with you? My blood runs cold. Who is this? I demand, trying to sound braver than I feel. The line goes dead. I hang up, my hands shaking. It's probably just a prank, I tell myself. But deep down, I know something isn't right. I check all the doors and windows, making sure they're locked. The feeling of being watched is stronger now, a prickling sensation at the back of my neck. I decide to call a friend, hoping that talking to someone will help calm my nerves. As I dial the number, I hear a faint click on the line, as if someone has picked up another phone in the house. I freeze, listening intently. Hello? I say again, my voice barely a whisper. There's no response, just a faint, steady breathing. I hang up quickly, my heart racing. This isn't just a prank. 
Someone is in the house. I grab a kitchen knife, feeling a mix of terror and determination. I dial 911 again, my voice shaking as I explain the situation to the operator. The operator tells me to stay on the line and keep talking, but every noise in the house seems amplified, every shadow more menacing. I tell her about the footsteps, the figure outside, the strange calls. She assures me that help is on the way, but the minutes drag on endlessly. Suddenly I hear a creak from upstairs, followed by soft, deliberate footsteps. I clutch the knife tighter, my knuckles white. They're inside, I whisper into the phone. I can hear them. The operator tries to keep me calm, but the fear is overwhelming. The footsteps stop at the top of the stairs, and for a moment there's silence. Then slowly they begin to descend. Each step echoes in the stillness, drawing closer and closer. I back into the living room, eyes fixed on the doorway. The footsteps stop just outside, and the doorknob turns slowly. I hold my breath, ready to defend myself. The door creaks open, revealing nothing but darkness. I stand there, knife in hand, staring into the dark hallway. The footsteps have stopped, but the feeling of being watched is stronger than ever. My phone is still connected to the 911 operator, who is urging me to stay calm and stay on the line. I can hear the sirens in the distance, but they seem so far away. As I back away from the door, I hear another creak, this time from the kitchen. My heart pounds in my chest as I move toward the sound, the knife shaking in my grip. The kitchen is dark, and I fumble for the light switch, my fingers trembling. The light flickers on, casting harsh shadows across the room. Everything seems in place, but the sense of unease is overwhelming. I check the back door, making sure it's locked. Just as I'm about to turn back, I hear a faint whisper coming from the basement door. I freeze, straining to hear. The whisper is so quiet it's almost inaudible, but the tone is chilling. I'm here, it says, sending a shiver down my spine. I back away slowly, never taking my eyes off the basement door. I hurry back to the living room, my mind racing. The footsteps, the whispers, the figure outside. None of it makes sense. I try to stay calm, reminding myself that the police are on their way. But the fear is relentless, gnawing at me from the inside. As I wait, I hear another creak, this time from the hallway upstairs. My breath catches in my throat. I know I locked the bedroom door, but the thought of someone being in the house with me is unbearable. I clutch the knife tighter, feeling a mix of terror and determination. The footsteps start again, slowly making their way down the stairs. Each step echoes in the silence, growing louder and closer. I brace myself, ready to defend my home. The footsteps stop just outside the living room door, and for a moment there's silence. Then the door creaks open. In the dim light, I see a figure standing in the doorway. It's a man, his face obscured by shadows. He takes a step toward me, and I can see the glint of something metallic in his hand. My instincts take over, and I lash out with the knife. The power goes out suddenly, plunging the house into darkness. The TV flickers off, and the dim glow of the streetlights outside is the only source of illumination. My heart races as I fumble for my phone, using its flashlight to navigate. I head back downstairs to check the fuse box, my footsteps echoing in the silence. As I reach the bottom of the stairs, I hear a creak behind me. I spin around, shining the light into the darkness, but see nothing. My breath comes in shallow gasps as I make my way to the basement door. I don't want to go down there, but I need to get the power back on. The basement is colder than the rest of the house, and the air is thick with the scent of damp earth. I descend the stairs, the flashlight's beam cutting through the darkness. The light flickers, casting eerie shadows on the walls. I reach the fuse box and see that nothing appears out of place. I flip the main switch, and the lights flicker back on bringing a temporary sense of relief. Just as I'm about to head back upstairs, I hear a whisper. It's faint, but unmistakable. I'm here, it says. I whip around, shining the light frantically. There's no one there, but the sense of being watched is overwhelming. I race back upstairs, slamming the basement door behind me. My heart is pounding, and I know I can't stay here. I need to call for help. 
I grab my phone and dial 911, trying to keep my voice steady as I explain the situation to the operator. They assure me that help is on the way, but every second feels like an eternity. I pace the living room, my eyes darting to the locked doors and windows. Then I hear it again, the faint sound of footsteps, this time coming from upstairs. My stomach churns with fear. I know I locked the bedroom door, but the thought of someone being in the house with me is unbearable. I clutch a kitchen knife, feeling a mix of terror and determination. The footsteps grow louder, and I can hear them descending the stairs. My hands are shaking, but I grip the knife tighter, ready to defend myself. The footsteps stop just outside the living room door, and for a moment, there's silence. Then the door creaks open. In the dim light, I see a figure standing in the doorway. It's a man, his face obscured by shadows. He takes a step toward me, and I can see the glint of something metallic in his hand. My instincts take over, and I lash out with the knife. The figure crumples to the floor, the knife slipping from his grasp. I stand there, panting, staring at the body in shock. The adrenaline rush is fading, and the reality of what just happened is sinking in. I collapse to the floor, sobbing as I wait for the police to arrive. When they finally do, they search the house and find no one else. The man I stabbed is a stranger, someone I've never seen before. They take my statement, trying to piece together what happened. All I can think about is the feeling of being watched, the whispers and the footsteps. The police assure me that I'm safe, but I can't shake the feeling of unease. They leave an officer outside for the night, just in case. I try to sleep, but every creak and groan of the house sets my nerves on edge. The image of the man's face haunts me, his eyes wide with shock and pain. As the night drags on, I hear faint noises from the basement again. My heart races and I clutch the blanket tighter around me. I know I should check it out, but the thought of going back down there is too terrifying. I lie in bed staring at the ceiling, listening to the whispers. Morning finally comes, bringing a brief respite from the fear. The officer outside assures me that nothing happened during the night, but the sense of being watched remains. I try to go about my day, but the events of the previous night weigh heavily on my mind. I decide to clean the basement, hoping to dispel some of the lingering dread. As I sort through old boxes and furniture, I find more unfamiliar objects. A child's doll, a worn-out shoe, an old photograph of a family I've never seen before. The whispers seem to grow louder, echoing in the back of my mind. I can't ignore the feeling that something terrible happened here. Something that left a dark stain on the house. The sense of being watched is stronger than ever, and I find myself constantly looking over my shoulder. Every shadow seems to hide a lurking presence, every whisper a reminder of the horrors that lurk in the darkness. I grab my phone and dial 911, trying to keep my voice steady as I explain the situation to the operator. They assure me that help is on the way, but every second feels like an eternity. I pace the living room, my eyes darting to the locked doors and windows. Then I hear it again, the faint sound of footsteps, this time coming from upstairs. My stomach churns with fear. I know I locked the bedroom door, but the thought of someone being in the house with me is unbearable. I clutch a kitchen knife, feeling a mix of terror and determination. The footsteps grow louder and I can hear them descending the stairs. My hands are shaking, but I grip the knife tighter, ready to defend myself. The footsteps stop just outside the living room door and for a moment there's silence. Then the door creaks open. In the dim light I see a figure standing in the doorway. It's a man, his face obscured by shadows. He takes a step toward me, and I can see the glint of something metallic in his hand. My instincts take over and I lash out with the knife. The figure crumples to the floor, the knife slipping from his grasp. I stand there panting, staring at the body in shock. The adrenaline rush is fading, and the reality of what just happened is sinking in. I collapse to the floor, sobbing as I wait for the police to arrive. When they finally do, they search the house and find no one else. The man I stabbed is a stranger, someone I've never seen before. They take my statement, trying to piece together what happened. All I can think about is the feeling of being watched, the whispers, and the footsteps. The police assure me that I'm safe, but I can't shake the feeling of unease. They leave an officer outside for the night, just in case. I try to sleep, 
but every creak and groan of the house sets my nerves on edge. The image of the man's face haunts me, his eyes wide with shock and pain. As the night drags on, I hear faint noises from the basement again. My heart races, and I clutch the blanket tighter around me. I know I should check it out, but the thought of going back down there is too terrifying. I lie in bed, staring at the ceiling, listening to the whispers. Morning finally comes, bringing a brief respite from the fear. The officer outside assures me that nothing happened during the night, but the sense of being watched remains. I try to go about my day, but the events of the previous night weigh heavily on my mind. The footsteps grow louder, and I can hear them descending the stairs. My hands are shaking, but I grip the knife tighter, ready to defend myself. The footsteps stop just outside the living room door, and for a moment, there's silence. Then the door creaks open. And in the dim light, I see a figure standing in the doorway. It's a man, his face obscured by shadows. He takes a step toward me and I can see the glint of something metallic in his hand. My instincts take over and I lash out with the knife. The figure crumples to the floor, the knife slipping from his grasp. I stand there panting, staring at the body in shock. The adrenaline rush is fading and the reality of what just happened is sinking in. I collapse to the floor sobbing as I wait for the police to arrive. When they finally do, they search the house and find no one else. The man I stabbed is a stranger, someone I've never seen before. They take my statement, trying to piece together what happened. All I can think about is the feeling of being watched, the whispers and the footsteps. The police assure me that I'm safe, but I can't shake the feeling of unease. They leave an officer outside for the night just in case. I try to sleep, but every creak and groan of the house sets my nerves on edge. The image of the man's face haunts me, his eyes wide with shock and pain. As the night drags on, I hear faint noises from the basement again. My heart races, and I clutch the blanket tighter around me. I know I should check it out, but the thought of going back down there is too terrifying. I lie in bed staring at the ceiling, listening to the whispers. Morning finally comes, bringing a brief respite from the fear. The officer outside assures me that nothing happened during the night, but the sense of being watched remains. I try to go about my day, but the events of the previous night weigh heavily on my mind. And the footsteps grow louder and I can hear them descending the stairs. My hands are shaking, but I grip the knife tighter, ready to defend myself. The footsteps stop just outside the living room door, and for a moment there's silence. Then the door creaks open. In the dim light I see a figure standing in the doorway. It's a man, his face obscured by shadows. He takes a step toward me and I can see the glint of something metallic in his hand. My instincts take over and I lash out with the knife. The figure crumples to the floor, the knife slipping from his grasp. I stand there, panting, staring at the body in shock. The adrenaline rush is fading and the reality of what just happened is sinking in. I collapse to the floor, sobbing as I wait for the police to arrive. When they finally do, they search the house and find no one else. The man I stabbed is a stranger, someone I've never seen before. They take my statement, trying to piece together what happened. All I can think about is the feeling of being watched, the whispers and the footsteps. The police assure me that I'm safe, but I can't shake the feeling of unease. They leave an officer outside for the night, just in case. I try to sleep, but every creak and groan of the house sets my nerves on edge. The image of the man's face haunts me his eyes wide with shock and pain. As the night drags on, I hear faint noises from the basement again. My heart races, and I clutch the blanket tighter around me. I know I should check it out, but the thought of going back down there is too terrifying. I lie in bed, staring at the ceiling, listening to the whispers. Morning finally comes, bringing a brief respite from the fear. The officer outside assures me that nothing happened during the night, but the sense of being watched remains. I try to go about my day, but the events of the previous night weigh heavily on my mind. As the police investigate, I sit on the porch wrapped in a blanket trying to process everything. The paramedics tell me I'm in shock, but all I can focus on is the knife still covered in hot blood, lying on the living room floor. When the cops arrived, the only thing they found was the knife still covered in hot blood. I knew that he was still out there, 
watching me. I stumbled into the old mansion, shivering as the cold, wet night air clung to my skin. The storm had forced me off the road, and this decrepit building was the only shelter I could find. The mansion, rumored to be abandoned for decades, loomed before me, its windows like dark, empty eyes staring into my soul. Pushing open the heavy, creaking door, I stepped inside, my flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. The air was stale, thick with dust and the scent of decay. The floorboards groaned beneath my feet, echoing through the vast, empty halls. As I explored, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Shadows seemed to flicker just beyond the edge of my light, and every now and then, I thought I heard whispers, soft and indistinct, as if carried on the wind. But there was no wind inside this forsaken place. I found myself in what must have been the dining room, an enormous table dominating the space. Cobwebs draped the chandeliers above, and the walls were adorned with faded portraits whose eyes seemed to follow me as I moved. I was about to turn back when I noticed the fireplace. On the mantel was a dusty old mirror, its glass cracked and foggy. Drawn inexplicably towards it, I wiped away the grime with my sleeve, revealing my own reflection. And something else. Behind me, in the mirror, stood a figure cloaked in darkness. My heart raced as I spun around, but the room was empty. The figure had vanished. I took a step back, trembling, when I heard a soft voice, almost a whisper, right by my ear. Welcome home. I fled the dining room, the sound of my own breathing loud in the eerie silence. Every corridor looked the same, every door led to more darkness. Panic set in as I realized I was lost in a maze of decay and shadow. Finally, I burst into a small room. It appeared to be a nursery, long abandoned. Toys lay scattered across the floor and a crib stood in the corner. The air here felt colder, heavier. My flashlight flickered and died, plunging me into darkness. Then I heard it, the soft cry of a baby echoing through the room. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as the sound grew louder, more insistent. I fumbled for my lighter, the tiny flame casting a feeble light. In its glow, I saw the cribs rocking, slow and deliberate, as if someone, or something, was soothing an invisible child. The crying stopped abruptly, replaced by a chilling silence. My lighter flickered and went out. In the pitch blackness, I felt a cold hand brush against my arm, and a voice, clear and cold, whispered from the darkness. Stay with us. I bolted from the room, desperate to escape this nightmare. Blindly, I stumbled through the halls, feeling the walls close in around me. The whispers followed, growing louder, more insistent. Faces appeared in the shadows, their eyes pleading, their mouths forming silent screams. At last, I found the front door and burst outside, the storm's fury a welcome relief. I didn't stop running until I reached my car, the mansion's silhouette looming in the rearview mirror as I sped away. To this day, I can't explain what happened in that house. All I know is that something ancient and malevolent resides there, waiting for the next unfortunate soul to seek refuge within its cursed walls. And sometimes in the dead of night I still hear those whispers calling me back. The world seemed to shrink as I drove the narrow path that led to the cabin, trees crowding close to the dirt road, branches brushing against the car like cold fingers. The sky was a steel gray, the sun a faint memory behind thick clouds, promising a night of snow. I always loved these escapes from the city, a place to breathe and unwind, alone with my thoughts in the untouched wilderness. As I pulled up to the cabin, the first snowflakes began to fall, gentle at first, then with a steadier, insistent pace. The cabin, with its sturdy log walls and smoke lazily curling from the chimney, was a postcard of solitude and peace. I unloaded my bags, the air crisp and cold, biting at any exposed skin, the silence a tangible presence. Inside, the cabin was just as I remembered, rustic, cozy, the furniture worn but comfortable. I lit a fire in the hearth, the flames taking quickly, the crackle and pop of burning wood filling the room. The warmth was a welcome contrast to the growing chill outside. Dinner was a simple affair, just soup and bread, but it tasted like a feast in the dim, flickering light of the cabin. Outside, the wind picked up, 
the trees groaning and swaying in the gusts, snow tapping against the windows like cautious fingertips. After dinner, I settled into an old cushioned armchair with a book. The storm outside grew wilder, the wind howling like a beast prowling the woods. I read by the light of the fire, the words blurring as my eyes grew heavy. Sleep was coming, and I welcomed it. But just as I began to drift off, a sound snapped me back to alertness. A scratch at the door, subtle but unmistakable. I told myself it was just a branch, the wind's plaything, nothing more. Yet as I lay my book down and glanced towards the window, I couldn't shake the feeling of eyes watching from the dark forest. I checked the locks on the doors and windows, a small act of reassurance. The logical part of my mind knew it was nothing, but the primal, instinctual part was not so easily convinced. As I headed to bed, the isolation felt less like solitude and more like exposure, the cabin a lone beacon in the engulfing night. In bed, I listened to the storm, the wind an eerie symphony, and as I finally fell into a restless sleep, I dreamed of shadows moving silently between the trees, coming closer and closer to the little cabin that stood alone in the woods. I awoke to silence. The storm had passed, and snow covered everything, a pristine white blanket that glowed under the moon's pale light. The beauty was surreal, almost otherworldly, but as I made coffee and looked out the kitchen window, I couldn't shake the unease from the night before. The day passed uneventfully, the quiet a stark contrast to the night's ferocity. I chopped wood, keeping busy, the physical work a welcome distraction, but every so often I would pause, a chill running down my spine, feeling watched. The forest seemed too still as if holding its breath. As evening approached, the temperature dropped, the sky once again closing in, heavy with unshed snow. I kept the fire roaring, the cabin cozy against the encroaching cold. Dinner was quiet, my thoughts louder than the crackling fire. After eating, I decided to check the perimeter, a flashlight my only companion. The snow was untouched but for my own footprints leading from the car. The relief was palpable, yet short-lived. As I turned back to the cabin, the beam of my flashlight caught something, a set of footprints, not my own, leading away from the window. Panic flared, a cold fist in my stomach. I followed the tracks with the flashlight, heart pounding. They circled the cabin, then disappeared into the woods. Someone had been here, watching, waiting. Back inside, I locked everything again, my mind racing. The isolation I had once craved now felt like a trap. I was alone, utterly alone. The nearest neighbor was miles away, unreachable through the thick snow and treacherous roads. Night fell like a curtain, swift and dark. The wind began to howl again, the trees whispering secrets. I tried to read, to lose myself in stories, but the words blurred into warnings, each rustle of the pages like the soft steps of someone creeping closer. A loud knock shattered the silence, sudden and demanding. My heart leapt to my throat. No branch, no animal could mimic that human sound. Frozen, I stared at the door, the knocking continuing, persistent, as if whoever, or whatever was out there knew I was home and would not be denied. The knocking stopped as abruptly as it had started, leaving a ringing silence in its wake. I approached the door, every step heavy with dread. Peering through the peephole, I saw nothing but the swirling snow and darkness. Whoever had been there was gone, or so it seemed. Returning to the fire, I tried to calm my racing thoughts. It could be someone lost, needing help, I reasoned. But why run away? Why not wait for a response? The questions spun in my mind, each more unsettling than the last. I decided against sleep, the coffee pot my companion as I kept a wary vigil. The fire's glow was a small comfort against the vast, dark wilderness that pressed close to the cabin's walls. Every creak and moan of the settling structure was a potential threat. Hours passed, the deep silence a stark contrast to the earlier knock. Just as my eyelids began to droop, a scream rent the air, a chilling human wail that twisted through the trees. I sprang up, the sound curdling my blood. Outside, the moon had risen, casting eerie shadows across the snow. I scanned the forest line with my flashlight, half expecting to see a figure lurking there. But there was nothing. Only the trees, their branches swaying gently in the wind as if laughing at my fears. 
The scream did not come again, but its echo lingered in my mind, a haunting melody that promised no peace. I fortified the door with furniture, a flimsy barricade that offered little real security but a semblance of control. As dawn approached, the world lightened, the dark fears of the night receding slightly with the rising sun. Exhausted, I allowed myself a moment's rest, my eyes closing just for a minute. I awoke to sunlight streaming through the windows. The storm passed and the world quiet. The barricade was untouched, the door secure. Had the night's terrors been a product of my isolation-induced anxiety? The thought was a comfort, however small. Yet as I stepped outside, the relief shattered. Across the cabin's wooden walls, written in what looked like charcoal but was too dark, too red to be anything but blood, were the words, Watch the woods. The message chilled me to the core. Someone was playing a game, but the stakes were all too real. I needed to leave, to escape the unseen watcher who haunted the woods. But as I packed my things, a deep primal part of me resisted the idea of fleeing. I needed answers. I armed myself with a hunting knife, the weight of it cold and solid in my hand. If I was being hunted, I wouldn't be an easy prey. I decided to scout the surrounding area by day, to look for any signs of my tormentor. The snow was a blank canvas, revealing little. I moved cautiously, aware of how exposed I felt. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig had me pausing, heart racing. But the forest revealed no secrets, only the endless whisper of wind through trees. Returning to the cabin, I found my nerves frayed, the isolation turning oppressive. I was a prisoner in my own retreat, my sanctuary turned cage. I couldn't shake the feeling of eyes on me, watching my every move. That night, I didn't light the fire. I sat in darkness, not wanting to draw attention with the glow of the flames. The cold seeped into my bones, but fear was a fiercer chill. I listened to the silence, a silence that seemed to listen back. It was then I heard it, a soft shuffling step outside, cautious but deliberate. I held my breath, listening as it moved around the cabin. I was not alone. Grabbing my knife, I waited, every muscle tensed for what might come. The steps stopped, and for a long moment there was silence. Then, a scrape at the window, like fingernails on glass. I turned slowly, my eyes straining in the dark to see. There, pressed against the window, was a face. A pale, gaunt face with hollow eyes that stared right into mine. I recoiled, heart hammering. The face disappeared as quickly as it had appeared, leaving me to question if it had been real. But the fear was real, as was the threat. I could no longer deny that someone, or something, was out there. I no longer felt safe inside the cabin. The Watcher knew where I was, could see me, perhaps even now. My mind raced with dark thoughts, paranoia my constant companion. I needed to act to end this nightmare. I set traps around the cabin, anything to give me an edge. Broken branches, trip wires, anything that might tell me where my assailant lurked. Night fell like a decree, sealing me within its dark confines. I waited, the knife never leaving my hand. Hours ticked by, each second a stretched agony of anticipation. Then, a snap. One of the traps. I was on my feet in an instant, flashlight piercing the dark as I headed outside. The beam flicked across the snow, catching nothing but the disturbed areas where the traps lay. I followed the signs, tracks that led deeper into the woods. My breath clouded in the cold air, my body slick with cold sweat. I was close. I could feel it. The trees stood silent sentinels, their shadows long and menacing in the moonlight. As I moved, the sense of being watched grew stronger. I was no longer the hunter. I felt like the prey, a feeling that made my skin crawl. I paused, listening. A soft laughter floated through the trees, mocking, chilling. It was close, too close. I spun, flashlight darting through the trees, catching nothing but night and shadow. The laughter stopped as suddenly as it had started, leaving a silence that was almost worse. I was being played with, a mouse before the pounce. Frustration and fear welled up in me, a scream building in my chest. I couldn't take it anymore. I ran back to the cabin, the laughter chasing me, 
always just behind, never quite catching. Safe inside, I slammed the door shut, locking it. My breaths were heavy, ragged. The knife trembled in my hand, my only defense against the madness outside. I slid down against the door, spent, my mind reeling. I didn't sleep. How could I? Every shadow seemed to move, every sound a signal of approach. The cabin felt like a tomb, the walls closing in, the silence a pressing weight. I was losing my grip, the terror and isolation melding into a delirium. Morning brought no relief, only the stark realization that I was trapped by more than snow. The psychological game was taking its toll, each hour a notch in the tightening vice of fear and paranoia. I needed to end this, one way or another. I ventured outside, the light harsh after the long night. The forest seemed different by day, less menacing, but the night's terrors lingered like a bad dream. I checked the traps, all empty, no sign of my tormentor. It was as if the night had been a figment of my imagination, but the fear was too real, too visceral to be imagined. I spent the day fortifying the cabin, preparing for the next encounter. Nightfall was now a thing of dread, the sun set, a curtain falling on my sanity. I was a prisoner waiting for my jailer to appear. As darkness settled, I positioned myself by the window, the one where I had seen the face. My eyes were wide, darting to every shadow, every movement real or imagined. Time crawled, the night a slow torture of anticipation. Then the laughter returned, a sound so out of place in the quiet woods that it was grotesque. I stood up, my whole body tense. The face appeared at the window again, but this time it didn't disappear. It stayed staring, a sick grin twisting its features. I yelled, a raw sound of anger and fear mixed together. The face didn't flinch, didn't move, just kept watching with those hollow eyes. Then, it spoke, a voice like gravel. You can't hide forever. I broke. Throwing open the window, I thrust the knife through the air where the face had been, but it was gone, leaving me to stab at the empty night. I climbed out, desperate, needing to confront my fear. The snow was deep, my movement sluggish as I pursued the retreating shadow. The trees loomed, the spaces between them darker than the night itself. I could hear it moving just ahead, the laughter now a whisper on the wind. Come out, I screamed, my voice breaking. Face me! But it was the woods themselves that seemed to answer, the wind howling through the branches, the very earth seeming to mock my plight. I stumbled forward, driven by fear and fury. The shadow flitted from tree to tree, always just out of reach, leading me deeper into the darkness. I was lost, the cabin a distant memory, the trees a maze with no exit. I stopped, panting, my breath a cloud of vapor in the cold air. I was no longer sure if I was following it, or it was leading me. Enough! I shouted into the dark. What do you want from me? Silence fell, heavy and absolute. Then, right beside me, so close I could feel the cold breath on my neck, it whispered, to watch you break. I swung the knife, a wild, desperate arc, nothing but air, and the laughter returned, circling me. I was in its domain now, a plaything lost in a game too twisted to understand. I ran, blind and reckless until I fell, the ground hard and unyielding. Lying there, the snow cold against my skin, I realized I couldn't win. Not here, not against this. Fear had taken everything. I don't know how long I lay there, the snow a cold blanket around me. Eventually I got up, my body stiff, my spirit broken. I wandered directionless until, by some miracle, I found the cabin again. It looked different now, not a refuge but a reminder of my terror. The door was as I had left it, open, inviting. I stepped inside, the familiar now foreign. I was a stranger in my own retreat. The fire had long since died, the embers cold. I didn't bother to relight it. Instead I sat on the floor, the knife beside me, useless. I waited, not sure for what. For it to end, perhaps. For the dawn that might not come for me. As the night deepened, the sounds of the forest grew louder. Or perhaps my mind gave voice to the silence. I could hear it moving outside. A soft, taunting rustle. I didn't move. Didn't look. 
I had nothing left. No fight. No fear. Only resignation. And then, as if the night sensed my surrender, it grew quiet. The oppressive presence, the sense of being watched, faded. Was it over? Or was this just another torment, another twist in the game? I lay down, closing my eyes against the darkness. Sleep, or something like it, took me. I drifted in a limbo of half-dreams, the night passing in whispers and shadows. When I awoke, the cabin was filled with light. Snow had stopped falling, the sun breaking through the clouds. I stood, the remnants of terror clinging like cobwebs. I was alive, but the relief was hollow. I packed my things, the cabin no longer a sanctuary, but a haunted memory. As I left, I glanced back. The woods watched, silent and inscrutable. The game was over, for now. But as I drove away, the echo of that laughter, cold and cruel, followed me. Was I leaving the nightmare behind, or was I carrying it with me, embedded in my soul? I hit the road, the trees blurring past. The ending isn't written yet. Not for me, not for the watcher in the woods. And as the cabin disappeared from view, I understood one thing clearly. It's never really over. Hello, I see that you are still with me. Excellent. Thank you for all your support and I'm curious about your location. Where are you watching me from? Now let's continue our dark journey and give this video a like. I'd always loved my grandmother's old house, a quaint cottage nestled at the edge of a dense forest. Every summer I would spend weeks there, reveling in the peace and quiet. But this summer was different. Grandmother had passed away and I was tasked with sorting through her belongings. I arrived at dusk, the sun sinking below the horizon, casting long shadows across the overgrown garden. The house seemed to sigh as I unlocked the front door, the familiar creak echoing through the empty halls. Dust motes danced in the dim light as I made my way to the living room. I could almost hear grandmother's voice welcoming me back. I set my bags down and began to explore, memories flooding back with every step. Each room held echoes of laughter and warmth, but now they felt cold and empty. The air grew heavier as night fell, a sense of foreboding settling over the house. The night descended quickly, wrapping the house in a shroud of darkness. I decided to start in the attic, a place I had rarely ventured as a child. The stairs creaked ominously as I ascended, the air growing mustier with each step. The attic was a cluttered mess of old furniture, boxes of forgotten trinkets, and cobwebs thick enough to resemble gauze. As I sifted through the boxes, I found a small weathered chest tucked away in a corner. It was locked, but the key was nowhere to be found. I decided to leave it for later and turned my attention to a stack of old photographs. The faces stared back at me, frozen in time, their eyes hauntingly empty. A chill ran down my spine as I heard a faint scratching noise coming from the chest. I froze, listening intently. The scratching grew louder, more insistent. My heart pounded in my chest as I approached the chest again. The noise stopped abruptly, replaced by an eerie silence. I found an old, rusty key hanging on a nail nearby, and with trembling hands, unlocked the chest. Inside, I found a single leather-bound journal. The cover was worn, and the pages were yellowed with age. As I opened it, a strange smell wafted up, like damp earth and decay. The journal belonged to my grandmother, and it detailed her encounters with a mysterious figure she called the Hollow Man. According to her writings, the Hollow Man was a malevolent spirit that roamed the forest at night, feeding on the fear of those who crossed his path. She wrote of strange occurrences, shadows that moved on their own, whispers in the darkness and the feeling of being watched. Her entries were filled with growing paranoia and dread. She described seeing shadowy figures lurking in the woods, their hollow eyes glowing in the dark. The journal recounted nights when she would hear soft, unintelligible whispers coming from the attic, growing louder as the hours passed. As I read further, a sense of dread settled over me. Grandmother had believed that the hollow man had followed her home one night and had taken up residence in the attic. She had tried to communicate with it, to understand its purpose, but it only seemed to grow stronger, more sinister. One entry stood out. He watches me from the shadows, 
his hollow eyes boring into my soul. I can feel his presence growing stronger each night. I must find a way to stop him before he consumes me. The desperation in her words was palpable, a stark contrast to the loving grandmother I had known. A sudden crash from downstairs snapped me out of my trance. I bolted down the stairs, my heart racing. The front door was wide open, a cold wind blowing through the house. I closed it, my mind reeling. Had someone broken in? Or was it something else? I spent the next few hours searching the house, but I found nothing out of place. Exhausted, I decided to go to bed, though sleep did not come easily. My dreams were plagued by visions of the hollow man, a tall, shadowy figure with hollow eyes that seemed to bore into my soul. I awoke in a cold sweat, the sound of whispering echoing in my ears. The voice was soft, almost soothing, yet it filled me with a sense of dread. I knew I had to find out more about the hollow man and what he wanted. The next morning I decided to explore the forest. The journal mentioned a clearing where grandmother had first encountered the hollow man. Armed with nothing but a flashlight and a sense of determination, I ventured into the woods, the dense canopy above blocking out the sun. The forest was unnaturally quiet, the usual sounds of birds and rustling leaves absent. The air grew colder the deeper I went a thick fog settling in around me. Every now and then, I would catch glimpses of shadowy figures darting between the trees, their hollow eyes watching my every move. After what felt like hours, I found the clearing. The ground was bare, the trees surrounding it twisted and gnarled. In the center of the clearing stood an old, crumbling stone altar. The air was thick with the smell of decay, and the temperature dropped sharply as I approached. I felt a presence behind me, and I turned to see a shadowy figure standing at the edge of the clearing. Its hollow eyes glowed with a malevolent light, and I could feel its gaze piercing through me. My flashlight flickered and went out, plunging the clearing into darkness. Panic set in as I stumbled back, the figure advancing slowly. I tripped over a root and fell to the ground, the flashlight rolling out of my grasp. The figure loomed over me, its form shifting and writhing as if made of smoke. It reached out with a skeletal hand and I felt a cold, clammy touch on my arm. A sharp pain shot through me and my vision blurred. I felt myself being pulled into the darkness, the whispering growing louder, more insistent. I fought to stay conscious, to break free from its grasp, but it was too strong. When I awoke, I was lying in the clearing, the morning sun shining through the trees. The figure was gone, but the memory of its hollow eyes lingered. I fled back to the house, my mind racing. I knew I had to find a way to stop the hollow man before it was too late. Back at the house, I pored over the journal, searching for any clue that could help me. The entries grew more frantic, detailing grandmother's desperate attempts to banish the hollow man. She had tried everything. Salt lines, protective charms, even rituals she had found in old dusty books. But nothing seemed to work. The hollow man grew stronger his presence more oppressive. She wrote of nights spent huddled in fear, the shadows closing in around her. The whispering would never cease, a constant reminder of the darkness that awaited her. I decided to follow in her footsteps, hoping to find something she had missed. I lined the windows and doors with salt, placed protective charms in every room, and recited the rituals she had written about. But as night fell, the house grew colder, and the shadows seemed to come alive. The whispering began again, soft and unintelligible, echoing through the halls. I could feel his presence, lurking just out of sight, watching, waiting. The air grew thick with fear, and I could see the shadows shifting, forming into something more tangible. I retreated to my bedroom, the only place that still felt somewhat safe. But even there, the whispering followed me. I could see the shadows creeping along the walls, their hollow eyes glowing with a sinister light. I tried to sleep, but the fear was too great, the darkness too overwhelming. The hours passed slowly, each minute stretching into an eternity. The whispering grew louder, more insistent, until it was all I could hear. I felt the bed shaking, the air growing colder, and I knew he was there, just beyond the edge of the light. I closed my eyes, praying for the morning to come, but the darkness was relentless. I could feel his cold, clammy touch on my skin, his hollow eyes boring into my soul. 
I screamed, the sound echoing through the house, but there was no one to hear me. When the morning finally came, I was exhausted, my body trembling with fear. The house was silent, the shadows receding with the light of day. But I knew he was still there, lurking in the darkness, waiting for the night to fall once more. Desperation set in as the days passed. The nights were filled with terror, and the days offered little solace. The whispering never ceased, a constant reminder of the darkness that awaited me. I could feel myself slipping, the fear consuming me. I tried to reach out to friends and family, but the house seemed to isolate me. Phone calls would drop, messages would go unanswered. It was as if the hollow man was cutting me off from the outside world, trapping me in his web of darkness. The journal became my only companion, a window into grandmother's own descent into madness. Her final entries were almost illegible, the handwriting shaky and erratic. She spoke of seeing the hollow man everywhere, his hollow eyes watching her every move. She wrote of dreams filled with darkness, of being pulled into an endless void. She spoke of a voice, soft and soothing, promising an end to her suffering if she would only give in. But she knew better, knew that to give in would mean losing herself to the darkness. I could feel myself being pulled into the same abyss. The house was a prison, the shadows my captors. I would see glimpses of the hollow man in the corners of my vision, hear his whispering in every creak and groan of the house. Sleep became a distant memory, the nights a blur of terror and exhaustion. One night, the whispering grew louder than ever before. It was as if he was right next to me, his breath cold on my neck. I felt a hand on my shoulder, and I turned to see his hollow eyes staring back at me. I screamed, but no sound came out. I was trapped in a nightmare, unable to escape. I don't know how long I lay there, paralyzed with fear. The night stretched on, each moment an eternity. When the morning finally came, I was a shell of myself, the fear having consumed me. I knew I had to find a way to stop the hollow man before he claimed me completely. Desperation pushed me to search for answers beyond the journal. I delved into ancient texts and obscure websites, looking for anything that might help me banish the hollow man. I came across a ritual, one that promised to bind and banish malevolent spirits. It was dangerous, but I had no other choice. The ritual required specific ingredients, black candles, salt, sage, and a personal item from the spirit's intended victim. I gathered everything I needed and set up the ritual in the attic, the place where the hollow man's presence was strongest. The air grew colder as I lit the candles, the flames casting eerie shadows on the walls. I sprinkled the salt in a circle around me and began to chant the incantation. The words felt foreign on my tongue, a dark language that sent shivers down my spine. As I chanted, the whispering grew louder, more frantic. The shadows around me seemed to come alive, shifting and writhing as if trying to break free. I could feel his presence growing stronger, his hollow eyes watching me from the darkness. I held up the personal item, a locket that had belonged to my grandmother, and recited the final part of the incantation. The air grew thick with tension, the shadows closing in around me. I could see the hollow man's form taking shape, his skeletal hand reaching out towards me. I mean a surge of energy coursed through me as I completed the ritual, the candles flickering wildly. The shadows recoiled, and I felt a wave of cold wash over me. The hollow man let out a guttural growl, his form dissipating into the darkness. For a moment, I thought it had worked. The air grew still, the whispering ceased. But then, I felt a cold hand on my shoulder, and I knew I had only angered him. His hollow eyes bore into mine, and I felt myself being pulled into the darkness. I awoke in a place that was both familiar and alien. The attic was gone, replaced by an endless void of darkness. I could hear the whispering all around me, a cacophony of voices that filled me with dread. The air was cold and heavy, the shadows pressing in from all sides. I tried to move, but my body felt sluggish, as if I was wading through thick mud. I could see shadowy figures in the distance, their hollow eyes glowing with a malevolent light. They moved closer, their forms shifting and writhing as they approached. The whispering grew louder, more insistent. I could hear my grandmother's voice among them, pleading for help, warning me of the darkness that awaited me. I felt a cold hand on my arm, 
and I turned to see the hollow man standing beside me. His hollow eyes bore into mine, and I felt a wave of fear wash over me. He spoke in a voice that was both soothing and terrifying, promising an end to my suffering if I would only give in. But I knew better, knew that to give in would mean losing myself to the darkness. I fought to stay conscious to resist his pull. The shadows closed in around me, their whispering filling my mind. I could feel myself slipping, the darkness consuming me. I screamed, but there was no one to hear me. In that moment, I realized that the Hollow Man was not just a spirit, but a manifestation of the darkness within us all. He fed on our fear, our despair, growing stronger with each passing moment. And I knew that if I did not find a way to banish him, he would consume me completely. With a surge of determination, I focused on the one thing that had always given me strength, my memories of my grandmother. I thought of her warmth, her kindness, her unwavering love. I clung to those memories, using them as a beacon of light in the darkness. The shadows recoiled, the whispering growing fainter. I could feel the hollow man's grip loosening, his form wavering. I recited the incantation once more, this time with conviction, calling upon the light to banish the darkness. The void around me began to crack, beams of light piercing through the shadows. The whispering grew frantic, desperate. I could see the hollow man's form dissipating, his hollow eyes filled with rage. I continued to chant, the light growing stronger, pushing back the darkness. With a final surge of energy, I broke free from his grasp. The void shattered, and I was back in the attic, the morning sun streaming through the window. The air was still, the whispering gone. The hollow man was banished, his presence no longer haunting me. I collapsed to the floor, exhaustion washing over me. The house was silent, the shadows no longer oppressive. I knew that I had won, that I had banished the hollow man. But I also knew that the darkness was always there, lurking at the edges, waiting for a moment of weakness. As I left the house, I felt a sense of closure. I had faced the darkness and emerged victorious. But the memory of the hollow man's hollow eyes would stay with me forever, a reminder of the darkness within us all. And every night as I lay in bed, I would listen, hoping that the whispering would never return. The old house I rented gives me the chills. From the moment I first set foot in it, I felt an undeniable presence, as if the walls themselves were watching me. At night, the feeling intensified. The creaks and groans of the settling foundation seemed almost deliberate, a language I couldn't understand. The first night as I lay in bed, I could swear I felt eyes on me from the dark corner of the room. It was an imposing structure, Victorian in design with peeling paint and overgrown ivy clinging to its facade like the fingers of the dead. The windows were tall and narrow, and at night they transformed into dark, watchful eyes. Inside, the air was always a bit too cold, the silence a bit too heavy, as if absorbing the faintest sound. The floorboards moaned underfoot as I explored, each step echoing through the empty halls and vaulted ceilings like whispers of those who had once lived here. The house was furnished with remnants of its past, aged portraits with eyes that seemed to follow me, ornate mirrors that never quite reflected the present. Each night brought an uneasy sleep. In the throes of half-dreams, I heard whispers, indecipherable, as if the house itself was speaking in a tongue lost to time. These were not the echoes of a building settling. They were insistent, urgent, filled with a sinister intent. On the third night, a storm rolled in, the wind howling like a chorus of the damned. Lightning illuminated the house in sporadic flashes, revealing glimpses of something more unsettling than the structure's eerie stillness. For a moment, in the brief luminescence of a lightning flash, I saw a silhouette against the window, not outside, where the branches of the gnarled trees thrashed against the panes, but inside, just across the room from my bed. My heart raced and I sat up, straining my eyes in the darkness that followed. But there was nothing, only the familiar corners of the room and the relentless storm outside. I told myself it was a trick of the light, a shadow cast by the tumultuous trees. But the unease nestled in my stomach did not subside. The next morning I found my things subtly altered, books not where I had left them, chairs slightly askew, and a vase of flowers turned to face the window, 
as though something needed to gaze out. Each alteration was trivial, easily dismissed on its own, but together they weaved a narrative of unseen hands silently molding my environment. That night, as I lay in bed, the feeling of being watched returned with such intensity that I could no longer dismiss it as mere fancy. There was a weight to the gaze, palpable and invasive. The air in the room felt thicker, as though charged with static, and the darkness seemed to pulsate with silent malice. I knew with sudden clarity that the house was not empty, and I was not alone. I started noticing small things. Objects slightly moved. A shadow that lingered a little too long after I turned off the lights. It was subtle enough to make me doubt my own sanity. Was I just jumpy, unnerved by the new environment, or was there truly someone, or something, watching me? The sensation of being observed became omnipresent, a constant companion as I moved from room to room. Each time I entered a new space, the air felt disturbed, as if someone had just exited. The stillness that followed wasn't peaceful. It was expectant, tense, as though the house itself was holding its breath. One evening, while reading in the living room, the feeling abruptly intensified. A cold draft swept through the room, causing the candles to flicker and the pages of my book to rustle. I looked up, half expecting to confront someone, but the room was empty, save for the dancing shadows cast by the candlelight. As I resumed reading, trying to dismiss the unease crawling up my spine, I heard it. A faint, almost inaudible scratching sound. It was coming from the wall behind me. I listened, frozen in place, as the scratching grew louder, more desperate. It sounded like fingernails clawing at the plaster, seeking a way out, or in. Grabbing a candle, I approached the wall tentatively. The scratching stopped abruptly, replaced by a low, guttural moaning that seemed to seep from the very bones of the house. My hand, trembling, moved closer to the wall, and the moaning intensified, as if provoked by my proximity. I retreated hastily, the moan trailing off into a stifled silence. The air around me grew colder, and I felt an unmistakable sense of anger, or perhaps resentment, that I had disturbed something best left alone. That night I slept with the lights on, a small act of defiance against the growing dread. The following days were marked by a series of unnerving discoveries. Photographs I had placed on the mantelpiece were found face down each morning. My phone, which I distinctly remembered charging on the kitchen counter, was discovered in the freezer, frozen and dead. These disruptions in my daily life were mild but jarring, serving as constant reminders that my presence was not alone, nor perhaps even wanted. As I laid in bed one night staring into the shadows that clung to the ceiling, I saw it again, the silhouette. This time it was clearer, more defined. A figure, tall and thin, with elongated limbs that seemed to writhe slightly as if swaying to some sinister tune. I blinked, and it was gone, but the image was burned into my retinas, haunting me with its vividness. The fear had rooted itself deep within me, growing with each unexplained event, each sighting of the elusive figure. I knew I had to leave, but a morbid curiosity tethered me to the place. I needed to know who or what was watching me and why. One night I heard footsteps. They were light, barely audible, like someone trying not to be heard. They paced back and forth above my bedroom, in the attic that the landlord had assured me was empty and locked. I lay frozen, my heart pounding in my ears, listening as the footsteps stopped right above my bed, and then, silence. The quiet was more unnerving than the sound of the steps. It was as if the air itself had been sucked out of the room, leaving a vacuum that pressed uncomfortably against my eardrums. I strained to hear more, but there was nothing, only the thunderous silence and the rapid beat of my own heart. After several tense minutes, the footsteps resumed. This time they seemed more purposeful, heavier, as if whatever was walking above me now cared less about being detected. The pacing was relentless, from one end of the attic to the other, directly over where I lay. The old beams creaked under the weight, sending a shiver down my spine. I couldn't bear it any longer. Flinging the covers off, I grabbed a flashlight and moved hesitantly towards the attic door. As I approached, the footsteps hastened, 
as though excited by my impending arrival. My hand trembled as I reached for the doorknob, which was oddly cold to the touch. Turning the knob slowly, I pushed the door open. The hinges groaned loudly, echoing through the silent house. I shone the flashlight upwards into the dark void of the attic. The beam of light seemed feeble in the overwhelming darkness. As I stepped onto the first stair, the footsteps ceased abruptly, plunging the space into oppressive silence. Halfway up, I paused, listening. The air was thick, charged with a palpable tension. Then, a soft whisper floated down to me, indistinct yet unmistakably human, or so it seemed. It was a voice, crooning an unintelligible lullaby that made my skin crawl. I couldn't tell if it was a warning or a welcome. I continued up, each step creaking under my weight. Reaching the attic, I swept the flashlight around. Dust particles danced in the beam, and for a moment, I thought I saw a figure dash behind a stack of forgotten furniture. My breath hitched and I called out, a shaky inquiry into the suffocating stillness. There was no answer, only the sound of my own breath and the distant rumbling of thunder. I ventured deeper, the flashlight's beam revealing relics of the past. Old trunks, broken toys, and moth-eaten clothes that hinted at lives long gone. The atmosphere was heavy with the scent of mildew and decay. Suddenly the light flickered and went out, plunging me into darkness. My heart raced as I fumbled with the flashlight, trying to restore its light. A soft giggle echoed around me, playful yet chilling, bouncing off the walls and surrounding me. I spun around trying to locate the source but found nothing. The giggling stopped as abruptly as it had started, replaced once again by the daunting silence. I was not alone, and the attic was not empty. Days passed and the shadows in my house seemed to move with a mind of their own. I would see a silhouette dart just out of view as I turned my head, always there, and yet not there when I looked directly. The dread inside me grew each day, festering like a wound. One evening, as dusk crept over the sky, the house's peculiar behavior escalated. The shadows lengthened and twisted, forming shapes that were almost human. These dark figures seemed to congregate in corners and whisper among themselves, discussing secrets meant only for the dead. I would sit in the living room, the only lights being the flickering flames from the fireplace, casting an eerie glow that made the shadows dance violently against the walls. As I watched, a shadow would occasionally break away from its counterparts and glide along the wall, as if inspecting me, sizing me up for some unfathomable purpose. The air would grow inexplicably cold whenever this happened, and the soft rustling of movement would sound behind me. I would whip around, heart racing, only to find nothing but the usual furnishings of the room. But the sense of being surrounded was overwhelming, suffocating, as if I were an intruder in a gathering of spectral watchers. One night, the phenomena took a more terrifying turn. As I lay in bed trying to sleep, a shadow detached itself from where it melded with the darkness of the corner. It moved towards me slowly, deliberately, its form vaguely human but with grotesquely elongated limbs. It stopped at the foot of my bed, and I could feel its gaze upon me, though it had no eyes. Frozen with fear, I could do nothing but stare as it hovered there. Suddenly it stretched a hand, a mere wisp of darker black against the shadowy room, towards me, I felt a chill touch my foot and I recoiled under the blankets, my scream muffled by the thick fabric. When I dared to look again, the figure had receded back into the darkness, leaving me to question whether it had been real or a figment of my frightened imagination. Yet the room felt colder than ever, the air thick with the echo of a presence that had definitely been there. After that night, the shadows no longer confined themselves to passive observation. They began to interact with the physical world. Doors would slam shut, the sound of their closure echoing through the silent house like a declaration of intent. My belongings would be moved, rearranged in grotesque tableaus that suggested a sinister intelligence at work. The climax of these terrifying occurrences came one stormy evening, when the power flickered and went out, plunging the house into complete darkness. The wind howled outside, a wild symphony that seemed to orchestrate the rising crescendo of whispers that filled the house. In that absolute blackness, the shadows converged upon me and I felt hands, cold and insubstantial, brush against my skin as I huddled, 
powerless, waiting for dawn or something far worse. Curiosity overcame my fear. I decided to check the attic. The door, which was supposed to be locked, swung open at my touch. The air was stifling, thick with dust and a faint metallic smell that I couldn't place. As I stepped inside, the door slammed shut behind me. The sudden darkness was palpable, oppressive, as if the very absence of light was a physical force. My heart pounded in my chest, each beat echoing unnaturally loud in the cramped space. The smell of metal grew stronger, mingling with the must of decay and old wood. I fumbled for the flashlight I had brought, my fingers trembling as I switched it on. The beam cut through the darkness, revealing a chaotic landscape of old trunks, discarded furniture, and piles of yellowed newspapers. The air felt charged, electric, as if the very atmosphere was alive with whispered threats. I moved deeper into the attic, the floorboards creaking ominously under my feet. As I navigated through the clutter, I noticed something unusual. A small, crudely fashioned doll made of twigs and scraps of cloth. It was hanging from a rafter by a piece of twine, turning slowly in the still air. Its face was painted with grotesque features, and it seemed to stare directly at me, its eyes hollow yet accusing. I moved past it, trying to ignore the chill that ran down my spine. The flashlight flickered as I did so, casting erratic shadows that danced along the walls. Each shadow seemed to twitch and writhe as if imbued with life, watching me with unseen eyes as I intruded into their domain. Suddenly, a soft thud sounded from the far end of the attic. I froze, shining the light in the direction of the noise. A box had fallen over. Its contents, a collection of old photographs, spilled across the dusty floor. As I approached, the temperature in the room dropped, a cold so severe it felt like it was biting into my bones. Kneeling down, I picked up one of the photographs. It showed the house, much newer, with a family standing in front of it. Their expressions were somber, their eyes dark hollows that seemed to look right through me. As I flipped through more photos, I realized they were all of the same family, yet not a single one showed them smiling. A sudden gust of wind howled through the attic, despite the lack of any visible windows. The photographs fluttered back to the floor, scattered like leaves in a storm that's when I heard it. A whisper so faint I could barely make it out saying my name. It seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere, a disembodied voice borne on the cold breeze. I stood quickly, the sense of dread overwhelming. The doll I had passed earlier was no longer hanging from the rafter. In its place a noose swung gently. The flashlight's beam seemed dimmer than before, barely piercing the darkness that felt as if it were closing in. I backed toward the door, my mind screaming for escape. But when I turned, the door was gone, replaced by smooth, unbroken wall. The realization hit me with a wave of panic. I was not alone, and the attic did not want me to leave. The attic was cluttered with old furniture and boxes. In a far corner I found a stack of photographs. They were all of me, some taken at my previous home, others just outside this house, and horrifyingly, several taken inside, while I slept. My hands trembled as I shuffled through them, each photo a violation. A cold dread settled over me as I examined the photos. The images captured moments I had no memory of being observed. Some showed me gardening, others walking down the street, each snapshot taken from a distance, hiding the presence of the observer. It felt like a breach of my most private moments. Turning over a photo, I noticed something written on the back in a hurried, scratchy handwriting. Watch closely, for you are never alone. The message sent a shiver down my spine. Who was watching? And why? The handwriting was unfamiliar, yet it carried a menacing intent. As I continued to look through the stack, the photographs became more recent and more invasive. The last few depicted me entering the house, looking over my shoulder with a faint expression of unease. Photos taken just days ago. My pulse quickened. The watcher was close, their surveillance almost constant. The air in the attic thickened, growing colder with each photo I viewed. A soft, malicious laugh echoed in the far reaches of the space, a sound so unsettling it froze me in place. I couldn't tell if it was in my head or emanating from the shadows that seemed to creep closer around me. I tried to leave, but the layout of the attic seemed to have subtly shifted. 
The paths I had walked now rearranged into a labyrinth of old furniture and shadowed corners. Each step I took seemed to lead me further into confusion, the exit increasingly elusive. Desperation mounting, I found a photo that made my heart stop. A picture of me, taken from the doorway of the attic just moments before I had ascended. The angle was from behind someone or something peering around the corner. I spun around, flashlight sweeping through the darkness, half expecting to catch a glimpse of whatever was tormenting me. But there was nothing, only the oppressive darkness and the feeling of eyes boring into my back. A low, guttural growl filled the air, vibrating through the floorboards. It was close, too close. I dropped the photographs and stumbled backwards, tripping over an unseen object. Scrambling to my feet, I faced where I thought the door should be, my breath coming in ragged gasps. The laugh came again, louder this time, and from directly behind me. I turned slowly, the flashlight illuminating nothing but the dust motes dancing in its beam. The sense of being watched was overwhelming, paralyzing. I was in the presence of something that didn't wish to be seen, yet delighted in my terror. I called out, demanding to know what wanted from me, but only silence answered, thick, suffocating silence that seemed to mock my fear. The photographs scattered on the floor seemed to be a map of my own horror, a breadcrumb trail leading inexorably back to this moment of realization. I was part of some twisted game, the rules of which I did not understand. As I turned to leave, the floorboards creaked ominously behind me. I whipped around to see a shadow detach itself from the wall. It was tall, thin, almost inhumanly so, with gaunt features that twisted into a grimace. It spoke in a whisper that made the air around me turn cold. You shouldn't have come here. The voice, though barely above a whisper, reverberated through the attic, echoing off the walls with a sinister, metallic resonance. It felt as though the words were spoken directly into my soul, a cold caress that left a trail of dread. The figure advanced, its movements unnaturally fluid, as if not entirely bound by the laws of physics. I stepped back instinctively, my foot knocking against a loose board. The figure paused, tilting its head slightly, as if amused by my fear. Its eyes, deep and dark, seemed to pull at the very light around it, absorbing it until all that remained was the void-like gaze that held me captive. Who are you? I managed to choke out, my voice trembling. The figure's lips curled into a semblance of a smile, more a contortion of discomfort than any gesture of warmth. I am the caretaker of memories, it replied, its voice a mix of gravel and silk. And you have trespassed into my domain, into the echoes of the past that resonate within these walls. And its fingers were long and ended in what appeared to be sharp, talon-like nails. It reached out towards me, and I could see the air shimmer around its hand the atmosphere distorting as if in the presence of intense heat. I flinched, expecting to feel those nails on my skin, but instead, it motioned around the attic. Look around you. Witness the residue of lives once vibrant, now only whispers. Why do you fear the past? It asked, its tone almost mocking. The surrounding shadows seemed to lean in closer, as if eager to hear my response. I don't fear the past, I replied my own voice growing steadier. I fear what it has done to you, what it has made you become. The figure paused, and for a moment the oppressive atmosphere lifted slightly, as if my words had reached something human within it. Then the grimace returned, more pronounced. You know nothing of what these shadows have borne, it hissed. The temperature dropped further, and I could see my breath clouding in the air. You see menace and malice where there is only duty, I protect these memories, guard them against the ravages of time and the intrusion of the living. As it spoke, the photographs on the floor began to flutter as if caught in a breeze, although the air was deathly still. They circled around us, forming a whirlwind of faces and places, faster and faster until they were a blur. You are part of this now, the figure continued, the photographs settling back down as suddenly as they had stirred. Your fear, your presence, it has been imprinted here, another layer in the palimpsest of this house. I looked around, overwhelmed by the gravity of what the figure suggested. The sense of being watched had morphed into an understanding that I was not just an observer, but a participant in a narrative far older and more complex than I could have imagined. 
the figure watched me, its gaze unblinking and unyielding. Will you flee? It asked. Or will you embrace the shadows? The choice hung heavy in the air, a challenge and a question that threatened to unravel the very fabric of my sanity. I stood silent, caught between the desire to escape and the compulsion to understand the depths of this haunted place. I ran, the photographs forgotten in my panic. The house turned into a labyrinth, corridors stretching and contorting in impossible ways. The creature was always just a step behind, its breathing ragged and eager. I stumbled into the kitchen, grabbing a knife from the drawer as I turned to face it. The creature halted at the threshold, its silhouette merging and separating from the darkness that clung to it like a second skin. Its breaths were shallow, jagged like the edges of a saw blade, and filled the room with the scent of decay. It eyed the knife in my hand, a flicker of amusement, or was it disdain, crossing its gaunt features? You think that will stop me? It rasped, voice dripping with malice. The air around it seemed to pulse, the shadows undulating as if alive. My hand shook, the knife feeling woefully inadequate, but it was all I had. I don't need to stop you, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. I just need to keep moving. With that, I bolted past it, my feet slipping slightly on the old tiled floor as I made for the back door. The house seemed to resist my escape, doors slamming shut as I approached, windows that were once there vanishing behind impenetrable walls. The structure moaned and groaned around me, an entity unto itself, seemingly in league with the creature that pursued me relentlessly. I ducked into the dining room, sliding under the large oak table that dominated the space. The creature entered a moment later, its steps deliberate, toying with me. There are worse things than being found, it whispered, the sound swirling around the room. Heart pounding, I crawled toward the other side, only to freeze as the creature bent down, its inhuman face inches from mine under the table. Its eyes were pools of nothingness, drawing in the scant light. Why resist? It hissed, its breath cold against my skin. I pushed back, kicking out wildly, my foot connecting with its chest. It stumbled backward, more from surprise than force. I scrambled up and dashed toward the foyer, the house's walls seemingly closing in, the portraits on the walls glaring down at me with silent accusation. Reaching the staircase, I took the steps two at a time, hoping to lose the creature in the upper floors. Behind me, I could hear it ascending, each step a pronounced thud against the old wood. The attic, I thought desperately, maybe I could lock it away there. But as I reached the landing, the door to the attic swung open on its own, a dark invitation. I hesitated, realizing the trap too late as the creature lunged, driving me backward with a force that spoke of centuries spent in this spectral form. The top of the staircase loomed ominously, my last chance to escape narrowing with each passing second. We stood there, in the dim light of the kitchen, watching each other. Its eyes gleamed with a malevolent intelligence, and I knew it was enjoying this. The power was out, the only illumination coming from the lightning outside, casting stark shadows across the room. It moved first, quick as a blur, and I swung the knife. The creature recoiled, not from the knife, but from the sudden brightness of a lightning flash that filled the room. It hissed, a sound of discomfort and rage, its sensitive eyes narrowing against the light. For a moment, it was disoriented, and I took advantage of the brief respite to put more distance between us. Its recovery was swift. With a snarl, it lunged again, moving with an unnatural serpentine grace. I swung the knife wildly, my aim thrown off by its speed. The blade sliced through the air, missing its mark, but the creature paused, wary of the weapon in my hand. You cannot harm what does not live, it taunted, voice echoing strangely in the room. I backed away, my feet slipping on the wet floor. The rain had started to seep in through the cracks and crevices of the old house, adding to the chaos. It advanced, and I retreated until my back hit the cold, hard surface of the refrigerator. Trapped, I raised the knife, my arm shaking. The creature smiled, a twisted, horrifying contortion of its already grotesque features. Your fear is delicious, it murmured, stepping closer. I felt the cold press of the refrigerator against my spine and knew I had nowhere left to run. The creature's breath was icy as it leaned in, 
its face inches from mine. Why resist? It whispered, its voice a chilling caress. Join the shadows. Let go of your fear. Desperation surged within me, and with a primal scream, I thrust the knife forward with all my strength. The blade met resistance, sinking into the creature's flesh with a sickening squelch. It reared back, a scream of its own echoing through the kitchen, a sound that was both human and otherworldly. The creature staggered, clutching at the knife embedded in its side. Black, viscous blood oozed around the handle. It looked at me, eyes wide with shock and anger, then down at the wound, as if unable to comprehend that it could be harmed. I didn't wait to see what it would do next. Summoning every ounce of strength left in me, I pushed past it, fleeing the kitchen. I could hear it behind me, its movements hindered but still fast, still coming. The house seemed to convulse around me, the storm outside mirroring the turmoil within. As I reached the front hall, the front door swung open violently as if thrown by an unseen force. The storm raged just beyond the threshold, wind howling and rain pouring in, turning the entrance into a maelstrom of nature's fury. I hesitated, the outside world just as threatening as the horrors behind me. But the choice was clear, face the unknown of the storm or the certain doom of the creature's wrath. The creature let out a shriek, and for a moment I thought I had wounded it. But it was too late. I felt its hands around my throat, squeezing the life from me. My vision began to fade, the edges of my sight growing dark. As I struggled, gasping for air, I managed to break free and stumbled toward the front door. I threw it open, the storm outside welcoming me with howling winds and pouring rain. I didn't look back as I ran into the night, the house disappearing into the shadows. Behind me, the echo of footsteps followed, relentless as ever. Did I escape? Or had the chase just begun? You decide. The rain pelted me mercilessly, each drop a sharp sting against my skin. Thunder roared above, a tumultuous applause for the scene unfolding below. I ran blindly, the mud sucking at my feet, trying to pull me back toward the house, toward it. My lungs burned with the effort, and my heart pounded like a drum in my chest, threatening to burst. Lightning illuminated the path sporadically, each flash a brief snapshot of the nightmare landscape. Trees bent in the wind, their branches reaching for me like the fingers of the dead, trying to drag me back. The creature's cries were lost in the storm's cacophony, but I could feel its presence, a palpable malevolence just at the edge of perception. I stumbled over a root and fell, my hands sinking into the wet earth. I scrambled up, casting a terrified glance behind me. The house was no longer in sight, but that offered little comfort. I knew that it, or whatever it was, wouldn't give up so easily. It was part of the house, or perhaps the house was a part of it, and I had invaded its domain. As I continued to run, the wind seemed to whisper my name, voices melding with the storm, calling me back. I clamped my hands over my ears, trying to shut them out, but they were inside my head, a chorus of the dam that wouldn't be silenced. The voices were mocking, telling me that escape was impossible, that I was bound to the house as surely as any ghost. The path ahead was shrouded in darkness, the trees arching overhead like a tunnel leading to oblivion. I pushed forward, every step a defiance of the fate the house had intended for me. The thought that I might just be running deeper into its trap was a terror I couldn't shake. Finally, exhausted and soaked to the bone, I collapsed under a large tree, its trunk the only solid thing in a world gone mad. My breath came in ragged gasps, and my body trembled uncontrollably, not just from the cold and wet, but from fear. The storm raged on, indifferent to my plight. As the adrenaline faded, a dreadful realization crept over me. In escaping the house, I had not escaped the horror. The creature was part of something larger, a malignancy that spread far beyond the walls of that cursed place. I was out of the house, but was I truly free? The night wore on, the storm never abating, as if waiting for something. I shivered, not just from the cold, but from the anticipation of what was to come. As the first light of dawn threatened the horizon, I wondered if I would see the morning or if the darkness would claim me forever. The last thing I heard, over the howl of the wind, was a soft, mocking laughter, 
drifting through the trees, reminding me that some doors, once opened, can never be closed. I had been counting the days, watching them slowly tick by on the office wall calendar, each one a small etching in my countdown to freedom. The idea of leaving behind the relentless pace of the city for a serene escape with my friends was intoxicating. Aaron, Sophie, Jenna, and I had talked of nothing else for weeks, dreaming up our perfect getaway to an old lake house secluded by an ancient forest. Yet, as the departure neared, a subtle unease crept into my excitement, a whisper of caution at the back of my mind that I brushed away as mere nerves. The night before our journey, sleep eluded me. My apartment felt unusually oppressive, the shadows cast by streetlights through the blinds morphing into grotesque shapes that danced on the walls. I tossed and turned, plagued by a recurring dream where thick fog obscured my path and unseen hands gripped my arms, pulling me deeper into an enveloping darkness. By morning, dark circles had taken residence under my eyes, and the dream's chilling touch lingered on my skin. We had decided to drive together, piling into Aaron's old jeep, the vehicle itself filled with echoes of our past adventures. But as the cityscape faded in the rearview mirror, replaced by the dense woods that flanked the rural roads, a silence fell over us. The usual banter and laughter were absent, replaced by a collective contemplation that seemed to acknowledge the growing heaviness in the air. As the miles stretched on, the skies darkened prematurely, thick clouds rolling in with a menacing promise. The closer we got to the lake house, the more pronounced the feeling of isolation became. The trees leaned over the road, their branches like twisted arms reaching out, as if trying to whisper warnings that were swallowed by the howling wind. Aaron broke the silence, his voice tinged with forced cheerfulness. It's just a bit of weather, folks. Adds to the adventure, right? But his words hung hollow in the dense air, and no one responded. Jenna stared out the window, her expression unreadable as she traced the droplets of rain racing down the glass. The GPS signal flickered and died as we ventured deeper into the woods, leaving us to rely on an old map that Sophie had thought to bring. It's like we're stepping back in time, she murmured, more to herself than to us, her finger tracing our route along winding roads that seemed too narrow and too neglected for comfort. Finally, the lake house appeared through the trees, its silhouette a stark contrast against the stormy sky. The structure was grand but worn its wooden panels weathered by time and elements, windows dark and uninviting. Yet beyond it, the lake stretched serene and still, a mirror to the chaos of the sky above. As we unloaded the car, the air felt charged, a static buzz that raised the hairs on my arms. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was waiting for us just beyond the threshold. The key was stiff in the lock, resistant as if it hadn't been turned in years. When the door finally swung open, it creaked ominously, echoing through the empty halls of the lake house. The air inside was musty, thick with the scent of mildew and decay. It's got character, Aaron joked weakly, stepping inside with a bravado I could tell he didn't feel. The rest of us followed, our footsteps unnaturally loud against the old wooden floors. Inside, the house was shrouded in shadows, each corner a breeding ground for the dark imaginations of our anxious minds. The furniture was draped in white sheets, giving the impression of ghosts lurking in every room. Jenna pulled off a few covers, sending a cloud of dust into the air that made us cough and sputter. It's like no one's been here for decades, she said, a note of worry threading her words. We explored the lower floors together, opening windows to dispel the gloom and the stale air. But each room seemed to resist our efforts, shadows clinging stubbornly in the corners. The house was larger than we had expected, with numerous rooms and corridors branching off in confusing patterns. It was easy to imagine getting lost within its walls. As dusk fell, the house seemed to settle, wooden beams groaning under the weight of the building, or perhaps something else. The wind picked up, howling around the eaves, creating sounds that could almost be mistaken for whispers. Sophie clutched her sweater tighter around her as she glanced nervously at the windows. It sounds like someone is talking, she murmured. Aaron tried to lighten the mood by setting up a fire in the grand fireplace in the living room. The flames took reluctantly, as if the dampness of the place sought to suppress the warmth. But eventually it caught, 
casting flickering light that only seemed to make the shadows dance more wildly. There, he said, standing back with a grin that didn't quite reach his eyes. That's better, right? We agreed to set up our sleeping areas in the same room, the large den that looked out over the lake. The wind seemed less severe there, and with all of us together, the creeping dread that followed us through the house felt somewhat abated. We laid out our sleeping bags in a close circle, our makeshift camp within the house's foreboding walls. Dinner was a quiet affair, each of us lost in our thoughts as we ate. The storm outside intensified, rain battering the windows, thunder rolling over the lake like an angry god's proclamation. The power flickered once, twice, then steadied, but the threat of darkness loomed over us, as tangible as the storm itself. When it was time to retire, we double-checked the locks on the doors and windows, a primitive attempt at safety that did little to comfort us. As we settled into our sleeping bags, the house creaked and sighed around us, and I could not shake the feeling of eyes watching from the shadows, biding their time. The night was restless, filled with unsettling dreams and the persistent sense that something was amiss. I awoke several times, my heart pounding, only to hear the sounds of the house settling. Or so I told myself. Each creak and moan of the old structure seemed to carry a whispered secret, a breath of something sinister. Around midnight, the true disturbances began. A sound, distinct and deliberate, echoed through the house. A slow, rhythmic tapping coming from the floor above. We had explored earlier and found the staircase to the upper floors barricaded, the wood swollen and sealed shut, as if to keep something out, or something in. Probably just the house settling. Aaron whispered across to me, his voice a shaky thread in the darkness. But we both knew the lie in his words as the tapping continued, measured and patient, like the tapping of fingers waiting. Jenna sat up, her eyes wide and alert. It sounds like footsteps, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. Her face was pale, her usual fearless demeanor stripped away by the night's eerie chorus. We listened, holding our breaths, as the steps seemed to pace back and forth directly above our heads. Sophie clung to her flashlight, her knuckles white. Should we check it out? She suggested, but her voice faltered, making it clear she hoped we'd disagree. None of us moved. The idea of venturing into the dark, oppressive halls was too overwhelming. The footsteps stopped abruptly, replaced by a dragging sound that chilled the blood in my veins. It was as if something heavy were being pulled across the bare floors above. Then silence. Dense, suffocating silence that seemed to press against our ears. We spent the rest of the night in a vigilant haze, too frightened to speak much. Every shadow seemed to twist into menacing shapes, every gust of wind a cold finger tracing down our spines. The house around us felt alive, watching and waiting, its breaths measured and deep. As dawn approached, the sounds faded, retreating with the shadows of the night. We were left drained, huddled together, and dreading the coming of the next night. What had been meant as a retreat had quickly turned into a siege, the lake house a prison from which there seemed no escape. The morning light did little to lift the oppressive atmosphere of the house. It filtered through the dense canopy and weak gray beams that barely touched the gloom inside. As we moved around, preparing breakfast in uneasy silence, the sense of being watched grew stronger, almost tangible. Every glance out the window, every look into the dark corners of the house seemed filled with the anticipation of seeing something staring back. I'm gonna check the perimeter, Jenna announced suddenly, grabbing a flashlight. Maybe the daylight will make things seem less creepy. But her attempt at nonchalance fell flat, her voice a tense echo in the quiet kitchen. Aaron and I exchanged glances, neither wanting her to go alone, nor eager to join and face whatever might be lurking outside. Outside, the ground was soggy, the underbrush thick and unwelcoming. As Jenna led the way, her flashlight beam sliced through the fog like a weak scream. Every rustle in the bushes, every snap of a twig underfoot seemed loaded with menace. We hadn't gone far when Jenna stopped abruptly, her body tense. Do you feel that? She whispered, her voice barely audible. We're being watched. I can feel eyes on us. We turned in a slow circle, our flashlights darting through the trees,
catching only glimpses of the mist weaving through the trunks. But the feeling was undeniable. It was as though the forest itself had eyes, cold and calculating, watching our every move. The idea of unseen creatures hiding just beyond our sight sent shivers down my spine. Hastily, we retreated back to the safety of the house. Inside, the air felt even colder, as if the house had taken a deep breath in our absence. We need to stay together, Sophie said, her voice cracking with the strain of maintaining her composure. It's not safe to go off alone. Not here. Not now. The rest of the day passed in a blur of anxious activity. We tried to busy ourselves, cleaning and exploring the parts of the house we hadn't yet seen. But the feeling of being watched never left us. In one room, the walls were lined with old, faded pictures of people who must have once called this place home. Their eyes, fixed and staring from behind the glass of their frames, seemed to follow us as we moved. As evening approached, the fog thickened, swallowing the house in a dense white shroud that blotted out the end of the garden and made the windows appear like blank staring eyes. It's like we're being erased from the world, Aaron muttered, staring out into the white nothingness. That night, as we gathered again in the den, the sense of isolation deepened. The fog pressed against the windows, and somewhere in the distance a lone howl echoed over the lake a mournful, terrifying sound that seemed both very close and far away. We huddled together, listening to the sounds of the house settling, each creak and groan now a sinister whisper in the gloom. The next morning Jenna was gone. Her sleeping bag lay empty, a cold hollow in the place she'd slept. Panic set in immediately. Frantic voices filled the room, each of us calling her name, hoping for a response that never came. She must have gone outside, Sophie speculated terror sharp in her tone. Maybe she thought she heard something. Or someone. We split up to search, despite knowing better, driven by desperation. The house seemed to resist our efforts, corridors stretching longer than before, doors stuck shut or creaking open ominously. Outside, the fog was a physical barrier, impenetrable and unyielding. We called her name until our voices were hoarse the only answer, the mocking echo of our own cries. Hours passed with no sign of Jenna. The reality of her disappearance settled over us like a shroud. We regrouped in the house, faces drawn and pale. We need to leave, Aaron said, the first to voice what we were all thinking. But as we discussed plans, a chilling realization dawned on us. The car keys were missing, and Jenna had last had them. As dusk fell, a suffocating despair enveloped the house. The fog outside seemed to press against the windows, thick and unrelenting. We were trapped, isolated, and now, one of us was missing. The house felt alive with malevolent intent, each shadow and sound a potential harbinger of doom. That night we barely slept, jumping at every sound. The house was no longer just an eerie relic. It was a malevolent entity, its very walls infused with a menacing presence. The feeling of being watched intensified, the unseen eyes now almost palpable in their scrutiny. Sophie's scream shattered the tense silence in the early hours before dawn. We found her in the hallway, her face ghostly pale under the flashlight's beam. I saw someone, she gasped, her breath ragged with fear. Outside the window, looking in. We rushed to the window, but there was nothing but the oppressive fog and our own reflections looking back at us twisted and distorted. The next day we were less than ourselves, shadows flitting through the house, jumping at shadows and flinching from the light. We stuck together, barely daring to speak above a whisper, as if afraid that our voices would attract unwanted attention from whatever lurked just out of sight. As darkness fell again, a new horror emerged. Notes slipped under the front door. The first simply said, leave. Each subsequent message was more urgent, more desperate. Leave now. Go before it's too late. We gathered them, a growing pile of ominous warnings, written in a hurried, scrawling hand. But with no keys and the fog as thick as ever, we were trapped, caught in a nightmare that seemed to have no end. The notes were relentless, each one more frantic than the last, as if urging us to flee from some unseen dread lurking within the walls or shrouded by the fog outside. 
we debated their origin, whether they were the work of a deranged mind, perhaps Jenna's, driven mad by the house, or something more sinister, an outside force playing a macabre game with us. But regardless of their source, the effect was the same, a deep, gnawing terror that clutched at our throats and tightened with each passing hour. Sophie collected the notes, linning them up on the living room floor, her hands trembling as she pointed out the increasing urgency in the messages. It's like they know something is coming, she said, her voice a whisper as if afraid to be overheard. Something we can't see, yet. Her eyes darted to the fog-choked windows, and for a moment she froze, her gaze fixed on something, or nothing at all. And that day we tried to secure the house as best as we could. Aaron and I moved furniture against the doors, while Sophie kept watch, her flashlight never straying far from her grip. The house fought us at every turn, doors jamming unexpectedly, windows that wouldn't close, and strange mechanical malfunctions that left us feeling even more vulnerable. As night descended, the atmosphere inside the house grew thicker, almost suffocating. The whispers seemed to emanate from the very walls, unintelligible murmurs that made the hairs on the back of our necks stand on end. Do you hear that? Aaron asked, his eyes wide as he turned his head, trying to pinpoint the source of the whispers. But there was no discernible origin. They were everywhere and nowhere, enveloping us in a blanket of dread. Unable to sleep, we sat huddled in the living room, the fire long since reduced to embers, casting ghostly shadows across the room. The notes continued to appear, sliding under the door with no sign of their deliverer. Each message was a blow to our already frayed nerves. Why won't they stop? Sophie cried, her composure breaking as she tore up a freshly delivered note. What do they want from us? The whispers grew louder as the night progressed, now clear enough that we could almost make out words. It was as if the house itself was speaking to us its voice a sinister hiss that slithered through the air. Leave, 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 it seemed to say, a mantra that echoed our own thoughts yet paralyzed us with fear. In a moment of frantic courage, Aaron decided to venture outside, convinced that if he could just reach the shed, he might find tools to help us break out. Sophie and I protested, but he was adamant, a wild look in his eyes that spoke of desperation and the raw edge of sanity. I'll be back before you know it, he promised, stepping into the suffocating embrace of the fog, his figure quickly swallowed by its dense white jaws. We waited, counting the seconds which stretched into minutes then hours. The whispers grew into a cacophony, pressing in on us from all sides. When dawn finally broke, Aaron had not returned. The house was silent now, the whispers gone as if they had never been, leaving behind a chilling void. Our last hope seemed to have vanished with him, and the realization settled in with a cold finality. We were truly alone. The silence of the morning was more terrifying than any whisper. Sophie and I barely spoke as we prepared to search for Aaron. Each step we took was heavy, laden with dread, as if with each moment, the house tightened its grip around us. We decided to stick close to the house, the fog still too thick to venture far without losing sight of each other. Our search was methodical, yet frantic, calling out Aaron's name into the silent, suffocating white. But there was no response, only the muted echo of our own voices. As we rounded the corner of the house, a chill unlike any other ran down my spine. There, on the ground, was a piece of Aaron's shirt, torn and bloodied, caught on the jagged edge of an old metal bucket by the shed. The sight of the blood was stark against the rust and a visceral fear gripped me. Oh no, Sophie gasped, her face draining of color as she clutched my arm for support. We scoured the area, hearts pounding, each rustle of the trees sending shocks of fear through our already tense bodies. But there was no other sign of Aaron, no trail to follow, just the ever-present fog that seemed to mock our efforts with its impenetrable blanket. Desperate and out of options, we returned to the house, the sense of urgency overwhelming. Inside, the silence was oppressive each creak and groan of the old structure a grim reminder of our isolation. We felt hunted, trapped in a game of cat and mouse where we could neither see the cat nor find a way out of the maze. That afternoon, the fog began to lift slightly, 
a thinning veil that tempted us with the promise of visibility. With renewed resolve, we set out again, this time extending our search around the lake. The water was still, a perfect mirror that reflected the gnarled trees and gray sky, a silent observer to our plight. Our search was fruitless, and as we stood by the lake, the reality of our situation set in. We were alone, likely being hunted, and without any means of calling for help. The isolation was complete, a psychological torment that fed our growing despair. As we turned back toward the house, a rustling in the bushes froze us in our tracks. A figure, shadowy and indistinct, darted between the trees. It was too quick to be human, too silent to be an animal. Whatever it was, it was watching us, hunting us. The realization hit us like a physical blow. We were prey in our own sanctuary. By the time we returned to the house, the sun was setting, casting long shadows that twisted like fingers across the ground. The house loomed larger than ever, its windows reflecting the dying light in a way that made them seem not empty, but watchful. We entered, the door creaking shut behind us with a finality that sounded like a sentence being sealed. The inside of the house felt different now, charged, as if the air itself was bracing for something terrible. We moved through the rooms, a last, desperate check for any overlooked means of escape. But there was nothing. No forgotten phones, no hidden keys. Just the growing darkness and the thickening silence. We settled into the living room, the same room where we had laughed and planned our days just a week ago, now a fortress in our battle against whatever haunted the house and woods. The fireplace was cold and unlit, the shadows deep and full of menace. As the last light faded, the tension among us grew palpable. We spoke in whispers, as though afraid that a louder word would trigger the unseen horrors lurking just out of sight. Sophie's voice was barely audible when she murmured, Do you think it's over? Her question hung in the air, unanswered. We sat in the darkness, the only sound the soft whimpers of our own breathing, when a sudden cold draft swept through the room. The temperature dropped a chilling caress that felt almost supernatural. It was then that we noticed the curtains flutter, a soft, sinister movement as if something or someone was behind them. Then, the unthinkable happened. A soft, almost inaudible thud from the corner of the room where Sophie had been sitting. I turned, my heart racing, only to see her lifeless body on the floor, her eyes wide open in a silent scream. Before I could move, before I could even shout, a dark figure emerged from behind the fluttering curtains. The figure was tall, shrouded in darkness, its features obscured by the shadows. As it stepped forward, the moonlight glinted off something metallic in its hand, a long, sharp blade that reflected a cold, merciless light. The figure moved with a purposeful grace, its presence overwhelming and terrifying. I stumbled back, my mind racing, terror rooting me to the spot. The figure raised the blade, the movement smooth and assured, a harbinger of doom. And as it stepped into the sliver of light, the last thing I saw was the blade coming down, the face behind it a distorted echo of Aaron, his features twisted in a grotesque parody of the friend I had known. Then darkness claimed me, swallowing everything in its cold embrace. Boo. Hello, sweet souls. How did you enjoy the stories? Let me know in the comment section. Now, to keep the tradition going, the poem. In the witching hour's embrace, shadows stretch across the lace. Dreams twist into a frightful dance, as silence gives the night a chance. Steel whispers in the gloom, echoes fill the ticking room. Fingers crawl like spiders, keen, seeping through the seams unseen. Eyes wide in the quilted deep, whispers promise no more sleep. Breath of fog, heart a drum. He comes for all, and then some. Fear grips with a spectral cling. Nightmares laugh and start to sing. In dreams, no screams are heard. Silent terror, undeterred. Thank you for watching everyone and now. Have a good night's sleep. If you can. Oh.